can y'all hear me? <laughs> okay. Well, I need. I do need this speaker for microphone for people to hear me. But thank you for coming. Always uh, good to see you. And great group as uh, we like to see. Today, of course, you know our topic is on uh, hearing, hearing loss and uh, various other topics, and we're honored to have with us uh, Lisa Ritchie, who is a doctor of audiology. She's with the Celine uh, Audiology Group that operates out of Benton and Hot Springs Village. So we're real proud to have her. She uh, graduated from Washita Baptist University with a bachelor's degree in community uh, disorders and then the University of Arkansas for Medical Science with a Master of Science in Audiology. And she got her doctorate degree from the Arizona School of Health Sciences. She has been in the audiology business with experience of 27 years, so she brings a lot of knowledge here today to uh, talk to us about this topic on hearing. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to touch on a lot of a lot of different aspects of audiology today. Um, start with explaining where I'm from. I'm from Celine Audiology. We have a clinic in Benton next to the hospital and one in Hot Springs Village. And that's my, uh, my partner, Cronona Miller, and myself, and that's my office staff down there. And I always like, this is my favorite audiology cartoon because I myself always <laughs> ate the chocolate bunny ears first. <laughs> um, hearing loss is really an invisible disability. No, nobody knows that somebody has hearing loss usually. Um, you know you know somebody's in a wheelchair, you know somebody who might be visually impaired, but it's hard to know that, uh, that someone's hearing impaired unless you see a really big hearing aid, and hearing aids are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, so you don't really, really see that these days. But um, hearing loss comes on usually very gradually, and it's really inconspicuous. People don't even know they have it themselves until they've got full-blown hearing loss. Okay, so it's really an invisible disability. But loss of hearing is a very serious uh, medical condition. It's associated with physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being, depression, anxiety, emotional instability, phobias, withdrawal. Withdrawal is a big one. Um, a lot of people become really isolated when, when they can't hear what's going on and they'll, they'll stop doing social things that they once did. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes less than self-esteem comes into play when you have hearing loss. Right now, about, they, they estimate that about 36 million people in America have hearing loss. That's a lot of people, okay? Hearing loss is the most common condition present at birth. 16% of school-aged children have hearing loss, one in five teens have hearing loss, one in six baby boomers have hearing loss, and hearing loss is the third most common condition in people over 65. They estimate by the year 2050 that there will be over 50 million people in the United States with hearing loss. Hearing loss usually, now this doesn't apply in all cases, but usually hearing loss occurs in both ears. It's usually worse in the higher pitches. It usually involves difficulty understanding speech. It's usually um, not reversible medically or surgically. I'm talking about sensory neural type loss right here. There are some, some losses, and we'll touch on those, that can be corrected surgically, but the, the hearing loss that most people have, nerve type loss, sensory neural type loss, cannot be reversed medically or surgically. And it most typically gets worse over time. Things that happen when people begin to, to, to notice that they have hearing loss is they'll turn up the TV too loud. Um, when children bring their older parents in to see me, Almost nine times out of ten, they say, you've got to do something with Mama. As soon as I turn the curve, going to Mama's house, I can hear the TV. <laughs> so, I mean, and that's, I hear that probably most of all, is that they turn up the TV too loud. People will ask, you know, you start asking people to repeat. You start answering questions in the wrong way. Miss the punchlines. For, for dramatic purposes on movies and, and preachers especially, when it's time to get 
the you know to get the message across, they will drop their voices and look down or something, and so you miss you miss the whole point of what, of, that they're moving up to the climax of it, and then you miss it when you have hearing loss. Conversation becomes difficult to follow. Um, people begin to say when somebody tells me everybody's mumbling, I know they've got hearing loss. Okay, they, when it's when they say it's not me, it's somebody else, I know that they've got hearing loss. Telephone conversations begin to come, become shorter because it's more difficult to talk on the phone and hear and understand on the phone. And like I said before, you become more isolated. You stay at home more and you don't get out and socialize. This is just a brief overview of eighth grade health, the parts of the ear. This is the outer ear. It includes the pinna, the thing that we see on the outside, and the ear canal. The middle ear starts at the eardrum and includes the eardrum and the three middle ear bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, which we learned in eighth grade health as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. And then this is the inner ear. The inner ear includes the cochlea, the seashell coiled up looking thing is, is our end organ of hearing, the cochlea. And then these are our three semicircular canals, our organ of balance. It keeps us upright in the world. There, there are basically three types of hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss, I'm going to go back. Conductive hearing loss happens in the outer and middle ear. Okay? The things that cause conductive hearing loss are impacted earwax, ear infections, middle ear fluid, problems with the middle ear bones, um, otosclerosis um, is a problem with the middle ear bones, perforation of the eardrum, and congenital deformities. If you're born without some of the parts, you will have conductive hearing loss. Okay? Sensory neural hearing loss happens in the cochlea and the, in the nerve of hearing that, that sends the impulse to the brain. Okay? And some of those things are hereditary factors, noise exposure, the aging process, which um, the aging process begins to kick in after the age of 50. Um, viral infections and ototoxic drugs, all those things, brain tumors, uh, tumors on the hearing nerve, those can cause sensory neural type hearing loss. And then um, we talk about mixed hearing loss when you have a combination of both. Okay? When we do audiograms, um, we, we test several different pitches which run across the top of the audiogram there. And then loudness runs down the, the side. And we plot each ear on an audiogram. And then when, it, when the thresholds fall in different areas, you know, it, it's, my, it's normal hearing up there, 0 to 15, and then mild, moderate, severe, and profound. These are some audiograms that I pulled, and I just wanted to kind of explain them to you. This is a person with normal hearing. The uh, circles are usually in red. That represents the right ear. And the X's are usually in blue or black. That represents the left ear. And we say that normal hearing happens between 0 to 15, 0 to 20. So if, you, if your thresholds fall in that area, you are considered to have normal hearing. Okay, so this person has normal hearing. This is an example of a conductive hearing loss. Kids with, hearing, with uh, ear infections will have conductive hearing loss, okay? Where, if you see these greater than, less than signs up in a normal range, that is when we bypass the middle ear and go straight to the inner ear with bone conduction. We'll put a bone conduction oscillator and vibrate the skull back there. If you hear normal by bone conduction, we'll plot that up there. And then if there is a gap between the bone conduction thresholds and the air conduction thresholds, you are said to have conductive hearing loss. Those don't match. There's a gap between them. That is a temporary hearing loss that can be fixed usually. Can be, if it's caused by fluid, you get tubes or you um, get, have medication and you, the fluid goes away and your hearing will return to normal. If it's caused by otosclerosis, sometimes you can have a surgery, replace the stapes bone, and that, that, that gap will close. This is an example of sensory neural type loss. The bone conduction thresholds and the air conduction thresholds match up. There's no gap. Typically, sensory neural hearing loss will affect the higher frequencies first and then move on in and start affecting others. Okay? But this is an example. This is the most common type hearing loss out there, sensory neural or nerve type hearing loss. This is a, a pretty severe loss. This is a mild to severe loss, sloping mild to severe loss. It gets worse as the pitch gets higher. 
This is an example of noise-induced hearing loss, and we're going to touch on that a little bit more in the slideshow. But noise-induced hearing loss will have what we call a noise notch. It'll go down and back up almost. If it goes down and back up, you can bet that at least part of your hearing loss is due to some kind of noise exposure. Okay? So anytime you see that on an audiogram, audiologist knows that there's been some type of noise exposure when there's a notch right there. This is an example of a mixed loss. The bone conduction thresholds are triangles and, and greater than and less than signs now, but they're not up in the normal range anymore. Okay? There is some, some nerve damage here, but the air conduction thresholds, there's still a gap between the air conduction. Th so this person could have noise-induced hearing loss and an, an, an ear infection, a middle ear infection, causing them to have a mixed hearing loss. And so my job as an audiologist would be to, to let the doctor know this so that, that it could be treated so that we could make the thresholds, the air conduction thresholds, rise up to, to match the bone conduction thresholds and they won't have near as much hearing loss. You've got to get rid of um, the, the other part of the hearing loss so we'll know what we have at the end to deal with. I'm going to go over a few more things. I had a, a, a slide earlier, but to, to remind you, a conductive hearing loss is caused usually by fluid behind the eardrum or ear infections, otosclerosis, which is a calcium buildup on the middle ear bones, a cholesteatoma is a benign middle ear tumor. Sometimes if you have a lot, a lot of ear infections and you, um, you know, chronic ear infections, sometimes you will develop a benign tumor called a cholesteatoma that has to be removed. And then mastoiditis is when you have an inflammation that gets into the meninges and it starts, and it starts messing with you. And sometimes people will have a mastoidectomy and they'll remove that whole part. And uh, if they've had a lot, a lot of a lot of middle ear problems. And then nerve type hearing loss or sensory neural hearing loss, which is usually permanent, is due to noise exposure, family history. You might have a uh, uh, recessive gene for hearing loss fall upon you and you could have some hereditary congenital type hearing loss. Neurological disorders, meningitis, high fever, other things like that can cause those and cause hearing loss. Meniere's disease, which is a disease that will affect hearing and balance. Very dizzy with Meniere's disease usually. Aging, brain tumors, and metabolic disorders such as diabetes. There is a huge link between diabetes and hearing loss. So if you have diabetes, you need to have your hearing checked and followed. Noise exposure is uh, caused by um, that seashell thing called the cochlea that's in the inner ear. When noise comes in to the, to the cochlea, the cochlea has a lot of little hair cells, and I'm going to show you a slide about this, that run along the, 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 uh, the, the membrane there in fluid. Okay, It's a fluid-filled cavity, and there's little, little hair cells that run along there. When noise comes in, when loud noise comes in, it will just shear off those hair cells. Just, just break them off. Okay, and once that damage is done, it cannot, the hearing cannot be regenerated. And this is a, the picture, this is a, another view of the ear, and that's the cochlea. And that's where the noise-induced hearing loss occurs. Okay, this is the cochlea, if, it's, if I took it and rolled it out. Let's take it from that spiral shape and just rolled it out. These are the little hair cells that I was talking about here. And when, when noise comes in, it will just shear off those hair cells. We are born with more hair cells than we need. Okay? And if you've ever um, heard that little ee, real, real high frequency ee, and it lasts about, about three seconds and then it's gone, that's a hair cell dying. It happens to all of us. We're born with more than we need. Okay? So, and we lose them all the time. And it, but if we let ourselves have too much noise exposure, we're really killing some, and they cannot be regenerated, and then the hearing loss becomes permanent. These are a couple of more audiograms that show noise-induced hearing loss, and you can see that noise notch down and back up, down and back up. I know that these people, yes, ma'am. What about uh, earplugs? Does that... Yes. Yes, we're going to talk about hearing protection. You... You can prevent noise-induced hearing loss. 
just you, you can do it. I mean, if, I mean, we have a lot of people that say, well, it, um, years ago, I have a lot of older gentlemen that come in. Well, you know, they didn't tell me about wearing hearing protection, and um, I and it didn't ever hurt me really, so I just you know did it. But they but they damaged their hearing, irreversibly damaged their hearing forever. You know, when you when when you um, are in are in loud noise, you should if. You should be wearing hearing protection. If you have to raise your voice to communicate above the noise, you need to be wearing hearing protection. Mowing the yard, those kinds of things. Here, here are some examples or sources of noise-induced hearing loss. Mowing the yard, military service, iPods, and we're going to touch on that big time because I want y'all's kids to be safe. Um, music, um, shooting a gun, car races, concerts, tractor pulls, all those things will kill your hearing. You need to be wearing hearing protection. You can do it, but as long as you wear hearing protection, you're safe. There are many types of hearing protection out there, okay? Many types. Muffs are great. Um, these little cheap EAR plugs are great um, if they're put in correctly. I have a lot of people, I'll see a lot of people that just barely touch and they're hanging out. Not doing a bit of good. Not doing a bit of good. You have to take those things, roll them up a little bitty, and put them down in there and let them expand, and it'll shut off the, hear the ear canal. And that's when they work. Every piece of hearing protection that you purchase will have a decibel um, reduction rating on them. The higher the number, the better. Okay. Um, EAR plugs, if, they're, if they are inserted correctly, you'll get 30 dB of, of protection, and that's great. But e even 20 dB... Um, uh, protection is great, but, but noise is a terrible thing. Noise will kill your hearing, and so you need to really protect it. We make custom hearing protection. That's all my husband will wear. He would never take the time to roll up a, a, an EAR plug and put it in his ear, I promise. Okay? So I had to get him something that he could wear on his neck, on a string. And so he'll put it in, and then when he's through using the saw or whatever, he'll take it out so he can communicate still because he could, you know... You know, I've, I've seen people, mechanics and things, and they, their EAR plugs get so filthy because they're, you know, always taking them in and out and things like that. So you need to, the, the, the key to hearing protection is to find something that's user-friendly so that you'll wear it. It doesn't do any good if it's sitting on the shelf. It has to be in your ear to do some good. But there's a lot of different kinds of hearing protection out there. Custom hearing protection is relatively expensive. It's not terrible, but um, probably about $150 a set usually. And it's great because it's made for you. It's very comfortable. It's easy to put in. You can put it on a string and keep up with it, things like that. Question. Yes. Some firing range military police are going to the requirement for the plugs and the muffs. Is that If it's really loud, plugs and muffs, the, the more protection you have, the better. The more protection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are some, um, we're going to talk about music, because music is important to our kids, important to us, but um, I'm, 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 I'm being a big advocate about MP3 players and how kids are killing their hearing with MP3 players. They're going to keep me in business a long time, but they're killing their hearing, so we got we got to fix it. But this is an example of, of how loud music can be. Okay, A loud piano is 110 dB. Electric keyboard can be as, as loud as 118 dB. Violin, 104 dB. A French horn, 107 dB. Percussion. If your kids are playing drums in the band, they need to be wearing some kind of hearing protection. Okay? Um, electric guitar can be as loud as, up to 124 dB. And amplified rock music can be as loud as 140 decibels. Okay? These kids that have all the woofers and the tweeters and everything in their car and you pull up beside them at the stoplight and you're shaking, killing their hearing, killing their hearing, okay? Kids that if you can hear their iPod in the kitchen and they're in the living room, that's too loud and they're killing their hearing, okay? And on MP3 players, this is the, these are the rules, okay? You shouldn't listen to your MP3 player while you're mowing the yard or something like that. If you're trying to turn it up louder than the noise source, you're hurting your hearing. 
You run the damage of hurting your hearing. Okay? Very popular to wear your MP3 player while you're mowing the yard. Not a good idea. The, key, the, the rule of thumb is not over two hours a day, not over 60% volume. Tell your kids that. Not over, you can listen to a lot of songs in two hours. Average song length is three minutes. Okay? You can listen to a lot of songs in two hours. Not over two hours a day, not over 60% volume, and they'll be fine. My kids have them, and I, I tell them all this. So, you know, I'm always preaching it, but it's not a bad thing to do. It's just have to, there are rules that you need to apply. I wanted to touch on this because it's so popular, and, and, it's, uh, and people don't know about it. and uh, Not popular. It's very common. Um, benign proximal positional vertigo, known as BPPV. If you become spinning dizzy with change in position, you most likely have BPPV, and it can be fixed so easily. BPPV, um, the symptoms are true spinning dizziness, known as vertigo. Spinning, the room spinning around you usually. Okay, you can spin yourself, but it's usually the room spinning around you, and when you close your eyes, it gets better. So you just close your eyes and are very still. But the room is spinning around you. Um, you have... You have the dizziness with change in position, okay? If you turn over in bed to your left side and all of a sudden the room is going crazy and you just are real still for a minute and it'll, it'll settle down, you might have BPPV. If you bend over, yes, can be. If you bend over or look up, uh, uh, laying back in the beauty shop chair or the dentist office, if you get dizzy, you certainly could have BPPV. That's the position that usually will always initiate it, head back. Um, you'll, sometimes you will feel a jerky eye movement with the dizziness and nausea and vomiting. If you have any of those symptoms, you could have BPPV and it's easily fixed. Um, BPPV occurs, this is the organ of hearing, this is the organ of balance, the three semicircular canals. BPPV occurs when you have calcium deposits in your inner ear, okay, that un unwanted, they shouldn't be there. And you, it's a fluid-filled cavity, and it also has those little hair cells running in the fluid in there. If a piece of calcium gets in there, you turn your head, the fluid moves, and it, uh, that calcium will push on those hair cells, and it sends an impulse to the brain saying you're moving a certain way that you're not moving, and so you go into that spin. And it can make you very, very, very sick at your stomach. It, it's, dizziness is awful, okay? Spinning dizziness will make you really, really sick. And it can, this particular, this is the most common, the most common cause of dizziness out there, BPPV. People used to call it have an inner ear infection. And you can still have a labyrinthitis and things like that, but most of the time it will be BPPV that can be fixed. And we can tell the difference when you come in usually. So the treatment for it is called cantilever three positioning or an Epley maneuver. It's a, it's a calculated maneuver that you do turning the head and, and, and timing things. Um, because it's a fluid filled cavity, when you turn the head, you can use centrifugal force in your, um, uh, to your advantage to move those calcium deposits through each of the three canals and get it out of there. And then you're fine. And then sometimes it'll linger on and you have to have what's called vestibular rehab, which usually happens in a, is a, in a physical therapy setting where when we, especially if you have had BPPV for years, BPPV will come on, you will have episodes of it sometimes because the calcium gets lodged in a place that it's okay and then all of a sudden you move or you, I had one guy that fell out of the attic and oh my goodness, he had dislodged a lot of calcium and he was dizzy, dizzy, dizzy. Um, but, but typically, if you have BPPV, if you ever get it one time, you will get it again. Just like people that have kidney stones, unwanted calcium deposits in your kidney, um, they're, they're apt to get them again. If you, if you get unwanted calcium deposits, if you're a person that builds up calcium deposits easily, you know, you could be having BPPV if you're dizzy. I wanted to touch on this because this is near and dear to my heart. My mother had dementia. There's a new research out of Johns Hopkins University that, is, that states that the National Institute on Aging has found that seniors with hearing loss 
are significantly more likely to develop dementia over time than those who retain their hearing. The risk of developing Alzheimer's disease also increased with diminished hearing. Okay? That's big time. So what am I supposed to do as an audiologist? Okay? What I'm supposed to do about this is I'm supposed to teach patients strategies to help their hearing aids work optimally. They don't need to be in the drawer. They need to be being worn. I need to provide amplified telephones. Uh, rehab services, a lot of times, will purchase amplified telephones for people. You just have to go through the right steps. You have to come see an audiologist, fill out paperwork. But most of the time, people can obtain a free amplified telephone through rehab services. And I'd be more than happy to talk to you about that. Um, I need to provide links to the television. My favorite type link to the television is a hearing loop, and I will talk about that in detail in just a moment. Closed captioning should be the last option because that's a whole different pathway. I want to use the hearing pathway, not the visual pathway. And I need to facilitate the placement of hearing loops in all venues with poor acoustics. Meeting rooms such as this, churches, theaters, auditoriums, concert halls, all things can be looped and, and, and it will help the hearing impaired people hear better and I'll, I'll see some confused faces. I'll clear it all up in just a second. Okay, but with this new research that has come out, maybe just maybe by assuming a proactive stance, the high incidence of dementia in our target population could be reduced while communication is improved if we try really hard to touch on all these things that, that the previous slide talked about. People don't need to wait until they're 80 or 90 to try hearing aids. If, if you put hearing aids on when it first occurs, start remapping those pathways. Keep them remapped through the, whole, through the long haul. Things will be better. I want to touch on hearing aids a little bit. Um, only 10% of all hearing loss out there can be helped medically or surgically. Only 10%. The other 90% is nerve type loss, and most of the time that can be helped with hearing aids. Not every time, but most of the time it can. And nerve type hearing loss, like I told, told you earlier, where the, where the air conduction thresholds and the bone conduction thresholds mesh, match up, usually get worse in the higher pitches, that's the most common hearing loss helped by hearing aids. Years ago, 10 to 20 years ago, probably 20 years ago now, people were told by, by physicians that hearing aids wouldn't help this type of loss. Not true. That was age old. That, that was true back then because it had a tendency to amplify everything the same. So if you had normal low frequency hearing and you were getting a broadband signal that was amplifying everything the same, it was driving people crazy so they couldn't wear hearing aids. Now we can be very, very, very frequency specific with how we amplify and, and can be in 90% obviously, of what I see is nerve type hearing loss. Probably 95% in my clinic is nerve type loss that I fit with hearing aids. Open fit hearing aids have changed the whole course of amplification in audiology. Open fit hearing aids make you feel open, not stopped up. That's, that was the main complaint with people wearing hard plastic hearing aids stuck in your like It's like walking around with fingers in your ear all the time. You felt stopped up, called the occlusion effect couldn't be helped. You would try to vent them and try to do some things, but you still felt stopped up. Open fit hearing aids, we sell 80% open fit out of my clinic because people like them. People will wear them. It sounds more natural. Um, it eliminates the barrel effect, keeps the ear canal open, and allows for a more natural sound. So open fit technology is the way to go. If you can wear it, that's what you need to be wearing because that's what, well, some people say, you know, I don't want anybody to see them. And these are really inconspicuous, especially for women because, you know, the hair. We match this part to hair color. And then this is a very, very, very slim tube, clear slim tube. It fits right up against your ear. People don't even know people have hearing aids on most of the time with this type of hearing aid. Now, some people want the little bitty, bitty, bitty completely in the canal hearing aids that fit way deep. And that's fine, but you will have an occlusion effect with those. You will feel like you've got fingers stuck in your ear all the time. But you can overcome it. You can train your brain to like it, but you're not going to like it at first. I want to touch on a telecoil, a T-coil. Most hearing aids these days are dispensed with a telecoil. Not all, 
about 68%, I think, is, is the percentage. Teak oils will help in a lot of areas, especially with what, we, what I'm going to talk to you about, hearing loops. Okay? This is where I saw the, the faces of confusion a while ago. Why do we need assistive devices? It's because of reverberation and echo. In a, in a large room, sound bounces, and it causes so much trouble for the hearing impaired person. A normal hearing person has the ability to focus on what they want to focus on and mask out what they don't want to hear. Once you become hearing impaired at all, you lose that ability altogether. A, hearing, a normal hearing person, if someone's using a chainsaw down the way but there's a red bird on the fence right here, you can focus on listening to the red bird and get rid of the chainsaw. Can't do it with hearing loss. So what is the best solution? Well, it could be this, I guess, a little ear modified ear trumpet from the Vermont Country Store for $9.95, but I don't think that's a really good option. Okay? Or I guess it could be something like this, but that's not really, really a good idea, I don't think. But I think that hearing loops for assistive devices, a hearing loop is the way to go. What is a hearing loop? A hearing loop is you run a copper wire around the perimeter of a room and hook it into a driver and hook it into a sound source, whether it be a PA system, a television, whatever it is, you hook it directly into the sound source. So in a church, if you looped a church sanctuary, you could... Um, Anybody that had a telecoil in their hearing aid could go to the telecoil mode. The, the loop is hooked into the PA system. You would hear the preacher straight from the microphone, straight into your ear. No, ver no reverberation, no echo, no background noise. It's great. It's awesome. Every church in the world should be looped. Ten years ago, about 40%... Um, of new hearing aid wearers couldn't use a loop because they did not have a telecoil in their hearing aid. Ten years ago, the, the big hearing aid that we were selling was a completely in the canal, little bitty tiny hearing aid, not big enough to put a, a telecoil in. That's changed. Now people are, are buying open fit technology and most, not all, but most all open fit technology now will have a telecoil in them. Today's telecoils are in about 68% of new, hear, of new hearing aids. Um, those most needing assistance by the use of a hearing loop and telecoil will have a telecoil in their hearing aids because the, the more hearing loss you have, usually your hearing aid's a little bit bigger you, and, and they will all, all have a, hear, a telecoil in them usually. Um, with portable receivers, loop systems can serve everyone without telecoil. So in a venue that was looped, you can still have little portable receivers that are, uh, that are loop listeners um, like you see other little, sometimes churches will have these little receiver boxes that you can use. That that's an FM system. Loops are better, in my opinion, than FM systems. Okay? But you can also, if you, if you don't have a hearing aid with a telecoil, you can get a little loop listener receiver just like those other receiver boxes. If we build it, they will come. If we start looping things, people are going to use it. Okay? The first TV stations had few, few viewers, and now we all have TVs and we all watch TV. So if we do that, people will start using them. Which comes first, a loop church or, peri or parishioners with telecoil equipped hearing aids? Right now, it's people with hearing aids. But I'm hoping in time that we can start looping all churches so that people can hear better in church. The two biggest complaints I hear, I can't hear the TV and I can't hear a church. The two biggest complaints I hear. This would fix it. It's all passive. I mean, as long as your hearing aid has a telecoil, it'll work. So you can put loops in senior facility common areas, bank and pharmacy counters, um, windows. Um, we just looped, uh, uh, we put a loop in a tire store in Benton. Um, the, the owner of the store is hearing impaired himself, and he wanted to be able to hear everybody. We have a microphone set there on the counter, and he has his hearing aid on telecoil all day long, telecoil plus mic, so he can hear the outside around him. He's hearing people better for the first time. Um, churches, movie theaters, concert halls, auditoriums, even vehicles can be looped. Taxi cabs in New York City are looped. Residential loops. Yeah, at, right now, we are giving away a home loop with every set of hearing aids that we sell because they work and they're great and people are loving them. You just 
loop your TV room, hook it into your TV, sit back with your hearing aid on telecoil. People can go to bed. You can put the TV on mute. You're still hearing the TV through your telecoil. It's great. It's great. Plus, you're hearing the TV well for the first time with a loop. You install the wire, connect the wire, connect the sound source, you're ready to go. We have, like I say, we're giving it away. We have an installer that will come install it. We're just giving them away because I want people to know how wonderful they are. And in, in venues where, where, where we would loop, it, you know, an audiologist needs to be involved because you've got to know if you have a telecoil in your hearing aid, you've got to know if it's turned on, you've got to know if it's right, you've got to know a lot of things. People have to understand how the whole thing works. So if we loop a, a venue, we're going to put a sign like this out there so people can know how to get help to make it work. Okay, I'm ready for questions. Yes? Nine e dB over eight hours is fine. Uh, more than that, you're going to get in trouble. Yes. I have two questions. How often should you get your hearing checked? If you have ringing in your ear, you have problems. Yes. Okay. The question was, how often should you get your hearing checked? And if you have ringing in your ears, is that a problem? Okay. Every if you, if you if you have a known hearing loss. Every year, not over every two years. Hearing loss, nerve type hearing loss is very gradual over time. So I, I, I try to make sure in our clinic that we, that we test for sure every two years. Every year is better. Every two years is okay because it's so gradual. If you have ringing in your ears, nine times out of ten, you have some degree of hearing loss. It's a side effect of hearing loss. If you have ringing in one ear only, you need to have your hearing checked for sure. That can be a warning, not always, but it can be a warning sign for other things. If you have hearing, if you have ringing in one ear only, get your hearing checked. If you're ringing in both ears, it's probably you have a little bit of high frequency noise induced, I mean, nerve type hearing loss, not necessarily noise induced, just no, nerve type hearing loss. Yes. No question is stupid. Yes, shouldn't if you. How significant? Okay, if you she the question is if you have a significant hearing loss in one ear, would the the two hour iPod rule still apply? The answer is yes. It's probably not. You you need to conserve every piece of hearing that you have, always. So I would say, yes, that that still applies. Most probably yes, but it'd have to be looked at. Now, the 60% volume rule on that one ear might not apply. You could probably turn it up a little bit, but you, it's usually you're hearing in both ears, so then you'd be turning up the other one. So, I mean, I would be very careful about that situation. But I would conserve everything you've got. I don't pick up in my right ear, but Most people will have a high frequency hearing loss, yes. It can be. It can be. She's asking if the if you have a low frequency loss, could it be nerve deafness? The answer is yes, it could be. But it needs to be looked at. If it ha has it been tested recently? Okay. Probably, you know, I, I would only in one ear. And it was never explained to you as to why. I would probably follow it because technology changes all the time and I would I would I would I would routinely have your hearing checked. I'd have to look at the loss, but probably yes. I'd have to look at I, I, I can't say without looking at your hearing loss. 
but probably yes. Then, but well, we just have to look at it. We just have to look at it and see. But I'd have to know what your audiogram looks like before I could make a determination exactly. Okay, anybody else? Yes. Yes, those are fine. Um, like, for what purpose? They, they are fine. My son has some too. No, no, they're fine. It, it, really, they are. They, because you, you, you don't have to have as much volume to make it work when there's a lot of noise canceling going on. So, yes, they're fine. Expensive, but fine. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. The question is, is there a rule about earbuds for MP3 players? Okay. Okay. Are you talking about that has a, that goes a little deeper than an earbud? Yes. Those are great because the closer you get to the eardrum, the less volume you have to have. Okay. Typically, I have a set, and I might have them with me. I'll show them to you if anybody wants to see them. Um, iPod ear molds are great. They're custom molds, and you put the earbud directly into the sleeve of the iPod. I'll show them to you. I think I've got them right here. But it allows you to to not have as much volume. Right. Right. But iPod ear molds look like this. So you put the earbud into this little sleeve. I don't know if you can see it or not, but I'll pass them around if anybody wants to see them. You just put it in there like that. Then the, the mold is custom made for me, and so I don't have to turn the volume up near like I have to when I just use the earbuds. Plus, it's ten times more comfortable. So these are, these are great. They're, my clinic or any, probably anybody, could, any, any audiology clinic could probably order them. Yes? Probably different for every clinic, um, but how, she's asking how long does it take? How, what, what do you expect if you go to your hearing test? Hearing test itself, I schedule an hour because I have to test it and then discuss it. So you get your right yes, get your results right then from from a regular hearing test. Yes. Um. It, it, well, that's a that's a difficult question to ask. It's not it's not concrete, okay? But they they say that 90 dB over eight hours is okay. You know, you can you can be in noise that long, but anything over that, you're going to run the risk of damaging your hearing. The longer you are in noise, time is also a huge factor with noise. The longer, if it's constant over time. You can't stay in it as long. And then there's all these formulas that you can use, how many decibels it is, how long you can stay in there, even with hearing protection. OSHA has all those standards out there. Somebody had a hand over here? Yes. In the canal or completely in the canal? Okay, probably could, and probably could be retrofitted into it. Depends on is it is does she have is it what size is that a little bitty here here? Well, you'd have to possibly could be added a T hole could be added, and she may have it now. For the home, four hundred dollars. And we, our installer charges $100 to install. You can install it yourself. The key is hiding the wire, okay? So you have to decide, am I going to put it in the crawl space? Am I going to put it in the attic? Can I hide it in the baseboard? Can I hide it in the crown mold? You have to hide the wire. Um, if, if the dorm room had a drop ceiling, piece of cake. This is a piece of cake to loop. I looped my waiting room myself with a drop ceiling like this. 
Any other questions? Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Lisa, so much. You're very welcome. Very informative. Uh, <clears throat> when you signed in, there were several brochures.